A lot of times when we're thinking about influencing somebody, we're thinking about how, what can I do that will change their mind? What can I say that will change their mind? When the reality is that what we're hoping to influence is their behavior. So we have this assumption, which is very often wrong, that first, what needs to happen to influence their behavior is their mind needs to change. And second, that if we do change their mind, then that will influence their behavior. And actually, both of these things are wrong. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Unleashed, the fastest hour on the internet, where every episode I'm joined by a best-selling author or accomplished leader who shares common sense leadership ideas, all in the name of helping you make a greater impact. I'm your host, Jeff Tetz. Most leaders feel their business could perform better. At Results, we help leadership teams achieve their bold visions by providing a unique system of accountability and ongoing coaching to create more predictable and successful outcomes. Reach out for a conversation at UnleashResults.com. How do you become a person people want to say yes to? That's the topic of today's conversation with Zoe Chance. Dr. Zoe Chance is a writer, teacher, researcher, and climate philanthropist obsessed with the topic of interpersonal influence. She earned her doctorate from Harvard and now teaches the most popular course at Yale School of Management, which is the basis for her international bestseller, Influence is Your Superpower. Her framework for behavior change is the foundation for Google's global food policy, and before academia, she managed a 200 million dollar segment of the Barbie brand at Mattel. Today, Zoe teaches smart, kind people to raise money for charity, get elected to political office, fund startups, start movements, save lives, find love, negotiate great deals and job offers, and even get along better with their kids. In other words, she helps people use the superpower of influence as a force for good. Zoe, welcome to Unleashed. Thank you so much, Jeff. Glad to be here with you. So I loved your book, and I, mean, I know I'm not alone, uh, that influence is, uh, is a very popular topic, but there were just so many pieces in your book that resonated for me. But, uh, but one of the things that caught my attention early on was the fact that you actually have spent time working at Mattel in the Barbie division. And I needed to ask you with just the resurgence in popularity of Barbie and, and uh, how successful the movie was, what are some of the thoughts that have come to mind for you in terms of your time spent working there uh, as a result of seeing the movie and the hype that's uh, been generated since? I'm just gonna jump in and just be totally real with you here. My reaction was kind of like PTSD because I really had a hard time when I was working there as a brand manager for Barbie and there was so much ill that was happening in the decision making at the high levels of the company. So all of that was coming back like whoosh when the movie came out. But about the movie itself, or maybe and also about the movie itself, um, I thought it was absolutely brilliant marketing. This was the biggest imaginable coup for Barbie to be able to say, Barbie is a feminist, Barbie is a symbol of women's empowerment, and Barbie gets you women. And if you get Barbie dolls for your girls, you're gonna be empowering them, where the reality is the Barbie brand has always been and has to always be because of the business model based on very superficial things like selling lots of dolls and selling lots of clothes and looking beautiful. So the movie was pretending that Barbie is something else than what the real brand actually is. So I was kind of amazed and kind of appalled. <laughs> did you watch the Barbie movie? I did. What did you think of it? Well, I I enjoyed it and... Uh, I did too, by the way, a I, lot. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it and I thought there were some really important messages that were shared there. But I think that, I think that was one of the questions I had was the, uh, the level of truth to what working in the Barbie division at Mattel was actually like versus how they portrayed it in the movie. And it sounds like, it sounds like there were, uh, there were some strong parallels there. Such strong parallels. And it was so hilarious. So the backstory of the history was very close to reality about Ruth Handler and issues with tax evasion. And also 
the Will Ferrell character, who is the just so arrogant CEO, was wasn't a specific CEO, but there had been a CEO before recently before my time who was so so arrogant and such a diva that when she was at work, she had a security team with her all the time and she would have the hallways and the elevators cleared so that she could walk through the building. We we were in these tall gray towers with gray cubicles that looked so much like Mattel looked in the movie. It was it it was amazing to me that they actually brought so much real history into it. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like we, we could do an entire episode just on the workplace culture <laughs> at Mattel. <laughs> so I'll, Let's I'll bring, definitely spare your listeners that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll bring us back to influence now and, and, the, and the main topic of today's conversation. And as I was reading your book, I, I couldn't help thinking about my childhood a little bit. Because I have spent my whole career in uh, you know 24 years now in sales. I never really knew what I wanted to do with my life. I, I never aspired to be a salesperson and I kind of stumbled into it by accident and then kind of found my calling. But when I look back at my life, I was always influencing people to do things. And like whether it was play a road hockey game or come to a football game, or I, I was always convincing my friends and my network to do things that they didn't necessarily want to do at first, but they were glad after the fact. And it made me wonder, mm. Zoe, what are your earliest childhood memories of using the superpowers of influence? Um, well, I definitely, like you, was at some point, but this was later in high school. So I guess this was when my skills started to develop, um, inviting people to come and do activities with me that they didn't necessarily think of. Like we would go and I, started a volunteer club and we would organize volunteer activities like, you know, like we'll go to a retirement home and we'll sing and we'll bring people flowers or we will um, take people with developmental disabilities swimming. And that actually is a terrible idea to have teenagers do that because it's quite dangerous. Um, and we would go on wilderness activities, things like that. Um, but I did that out of insecurity. I didn't start doing this because I just had this abundance of influence. I was insecure about not being invited to other people's parties and events. So I just started to be the party planner and group inviter. Wow. Okay. That's not where I thought you were going to take that because I experience that sometimes if I'm in a self-defeating mindset and I'm like, you know what, if I didn't create these events, nobody would invite me to theirs. And I, oh, there you go. <laughs> and that's, I think when, it, when I'm not in my right frame of mind, that's some of the, some of the self-defeating, you know, self-talk that I have. And I think where I've, where, I, where I've landed when I'm in a more positive state is that we all play a role in this world and some of us are catalysts and some of us are not. And that's the role that we play in the world. And it's not that people don't want you there, but, um, yeah, that, that strikes a chord with me. I never thought, I didn't think you were going to take it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I've evolved since then. Um, but actually, you know, now that I'm reflecting, there was one key incident that happened that was the very first of this cascade. And this happened when we were in our PE class, fitness class. Did you have, Jeff, in your high school where in gym class, it starts with there are two people who are team captains and they pick teams and the most athletic popular kids get picked first and then the least athletic least popular kids always get picked last that's I, yeah i can't imagine somebody not having that as part of their childhood experience yeah apparently not everybody did which i'm glad of my daughter doesn't have that now but it was so awful and i was actually pretty athletic i was i was shy, but I would get picked as a girl, as an athletic girl in the middle, but it really pained me to see the same people getting picked last all the time. And I hated that social hierarchy. So just once randomly, I volunteered to be captain. Nobody wanted to be captain at my school, but I volunteered randomly. And then I picked people in a random order. So I picked some of the nerdy kids, some of the athletic kids, some of my friends, some kids I didn't know. And then those kids, I got them together on the field. We were playing soccer. And I said, we're the fun team. Our job, 
Our goal is to have as much fun as possible. It doesn't matter how many points we score. We're going to have as much fun as possible. And you figure out how to do it. We had so much fun that day playing crazy soccer that I ended up volunteering again and again to be team captain. I would always have fun team. And then my friend Dave started volunteering to be the other team captain. And now we had two teams competing to see who could have the most fun. And this is something that was so just heart opening and memorable and confidence building. And this was when I realized that I could be a catalyst, like you're talking about. And I realized that anyone can be a catalyst and we can challenge the status quo and that other people are actually excited for the status quo to be challenged often. It's just that we didn't think of doing it. So Absolutely. I love using influence in this way. Well, and not just a catalyst, Zoe, in that example, but a, a catalyst for compassion. And uh, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty endearing and pretty, and as you were saying that, like, I, I can actually picture the, the faces and the names of my classmates that were always picked last and yeah. conversation for another day. But it makes me think about, you know, we don't do that at chess club or debate club. We don't set captains and pick players. It tends to only happen in athletic pursuits and it's such a narrow minded focus. So I, I love, I love what you did there to bring, to bring a lot of inclusivity to a world where there isn't much of it. Uh, I want to keep talking on the kid piece because you, you, uh, you made a, or you gave me a bit of a paradigm shift again, right out of the start of the book. And you talked about influence. We're, we're born into influence. And I'm like, Oh, that is brilliant. Because kids have, uh, and they learn to have their parents wrapped around their fingers from the, like literally from the time they come out of the womb. And, and so then I, I couldn't help but wonder if we're born influence, influencing those around us. What's the difference between kids that continue to use those, those skills of influence into adolescence versus the ones that don't? I think a lot of this depends not on the kid, but on the parents and on the teachers. And it's a lot of really well-intentioned, kind parents and teachers that try to train us to be good citizens. They train us to be good kids. They train us to be good students. And they train us to play small and not to advocate for ourselves, right? Not to negotiate, just to sit back, be quiet, work hard, wait to be recognized, expect a gold star to get whatever rewards we deserve. And then unfortunately, those of us, especially who are kind and compassionate and we want to be good community members and we just end up stepping back, we don't want to steal the spotlight. We don't want to, we're not greedy, right? But but because some kids are advocating for themselves and they become adults who continue advocating for themselves. And then others of us do not. We're bringing these kind of like good student habits into adulthood in the workplace where it really doesn't work. So what what, what would you notice would be different than in a household where parents are, are fostering those skills of influence and persuasion, I suppose? I got to tell you, it's really hard as the mom of a very influential and persuasive child. And I also noticed some sexism here. I think because my my daughter is a girl, I am just like almost everyone else inclined toward these unconsciously sexist thoughts and biases that she's supposed to be compliant and she's supposed to be taking care of other people and their feelings and being nice. And I have to make sure that she's not going to be perceived by me or anyone else as bitchy or bossy or bratty. So I, I struggle with, I want to help my daughter be a compassionate, and assertive human being, a compassionate and assertive girl so she can be a compassionate and assertive woman. But it's really hard because I get annoyed by her asking for stuff all the time. <laughs> and so I try to teach her to do it gracefully. Uh, and, and she's getting so much more graceful now. Well, and I think that's reassuring, Zoe, because you are an expert in this field. You teach other people how to excel and, and you have the same challenges that any parent would have. So I, I think that there's a reassuring component to, uh, to any other parents that are, uh, are going to be tuning in, looking for some tips of influence. And, and so uh, let's come in more into maybe uh, into a corporate or, or business context. And the, the work that we do primarily, Zoe, is with mid-sized firms, with, directly with their leadership teams. And we're all 
always trying to help them have more influence with their employees, with each other, with their customers and with their prospects and all of those things. And I, and I wondered if we could start off with perhaps some of the, uh, the misconceptions or, or how we approach it. You say we approach influence backwards a lot of time. And I wonder if you could clarify what you mean by that. A lot of times when we're thinking about influencing somebody, we're thinking about how, what can I do that will change their mind? What can I say that will change their mind? When the reality is that what we're hoping to influence is their behavior. So we have this assumption, which is very often wrong, that first, what needs to happen to influence their behavior is their mind needs to change. And second, that if we do change their mind, then that will influence their behavior. And actually, both of these things are wrong. So like, any, uh, do you ever make New Year's resolutions? Are you making one this year? No, I don't. Um, I do sort of my annual planning in the summer. And I think it's my like my silent protest like, against New Year's resolutions. Zoe, tell me why you it's, ask. <laughs> it Well, I hope that your summer resolutions are more effective than most people's New Year's resolutions. Apparently, 30% of people keep their New Year's resolutions, which I think is amazing. I haven't met many of those people. But when we think about topics of New Year's resolutions, which is often personal change, right? Like, I want to exercise more, eat better, you know, get more sleep, not be so obsessed with my phone. We're always looking at things that are decisions we've made, but our behavior hasn't followed. We want to do that thing, and that doesn't change our behavior, right? And it's the same with other people. Their decisions and their behavior are not necessarily connected. And then also, there are so many influences on our behavior that are unconscious, and we're just not paying attention to them. Like, for example, we just tend to do things that are easy, and we tend not to do things that are hard. Um, I write in the book about this marketing metric called the customer effort score, which is the most predictive metric of customer behavior. So anyone working in sales and marketing wants to know this metric. And it essentially comes down to a question that's basically, how how much effort did it take to do that thing you were trying to do? So maybe it's to get the information you wanted or reach customer service or make the purchase or use the product, whatever it is, the amount of effort that it takes is the single biggest determinant of repeat sales, loyalty, negative word of mouth, which is more powerful than positive word of mouth, which is more powerful than sales and marketing. So the amount of effort it takes is, this is 80% of the customer effort score, but the other 20% that's really important, and I actually, I'm just making up those numbers. It's just the majority is the actual effort, but also importantly is the perceived effort. And the perceived effort you can uh, bring home experientially when you think about last time you were on hold waiting for customer service to pick up the phone you're literally doing nothing there's nothing that's easier than just doing nothing <laughs> but it feels so onerous so you would say your answer about customer effort score would be it was a lot of effort to get the help that i needed so this is an influence on behavior ease effort, friction that has nothing to do with changing people's minds. Right. And so what are some ways then that uh, you mentioned the survey, but what are some other sort of practical ways that a company can start to take a look at how difficult it is to do business with them? Well, a really easy way to start is just by asking people. A simple but less easy way to approach it is with data analysis and you look at your funnel and you see where people are dropping off and then you look at whatever the stage is in the customer journey where you're losing people what's the friction in that stage and also if you do yourself it you can just very informally you and your team go through the process of the say we're talking about customers so say it's the customer journey and you just get to experience it's not rocket science how easy is it to find the information and how easy is it to reach your people how easy is it to open the package receive it um you can yourself get a lot of information about friction in the process and you can also just start 
copying other companies that do this really well. Like I use Amazon as an example in the book. It They make it so easy to buy things from them that it's probably harder to not buy things from Amazon than it is to buy things. And Domino's Pizza copied many of the things that Amazon was doing to make yeah. it easier. You're right. So You're you right. Figure out where the friction is, but you can also just start solving it. Yeah. And I, I feel that tension a lot because it's coming out of COVID. There's been, and rightfully so, a focus on shop local because a lot of small businesses in particular, more industries than others are really struggling. And there's a spotlight on that over the holidays right now. Uh, but still, like the fact that you can, you can resupply uh, your favorite items at a stoplight <laughs> in 30 yeah. seconds through Amazon, it's still not a, the shop local is not enough of a pull. Uh, sometimes. And I, so I, I fear what that means for local economies for sure. Yeah. And I think Jeff, that's a perfect example of trying to influence people by changing their minds when what you really want is to change their behavior. So you can tell people shop local and they say, that's a great idea. We love, who doesn't love the idea of supporting local businesses, but it doesn't automatically lead to a change in behavior. So it's gotta be shop local and then what a little bit, um, Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. How are we going to get people to shop local? Yeah. And so Zoe, Who already want to. And I was I find this topic of, of, of effortless uh, transactions uh, fascinating because on the and tell me if I'm wrong on this or if I need to change my thinking. But I've always believed as well that there is a certain level of friction that is important because like it, you don't want to work with everybody, for example. And so there's there's a certain part to, and I can think of like in our particular business, we're very intentional about inserting some friction where we won't work with a company unless they're willing to get their executive team together for a complimentary half day workshop. And that's a bit of a test for us to see how serious they are. So how do you balance that with knowing where you might want to insert a little bit of friction? I love this question, and I haven't thought of it specifically from this perspective, but just as you're saying, it is really important if you know that you have a situation where there can be a lot of attrition, and that's bad for you, right? So you don't want to have a lot of attrition after you've been investing a lot of time and money and resources. So you wanted to, you're essentially asking people to make a costly signal of their commitment. Okay. Right? Yeah. And and you are also doing something here in this process where it's very graceful that you're saying, we're going to do a free half-day workshop for your executive team where you are having internal influence go on at the firm before you even come in. And so people are influencing each other. There needs to be, it not just magically all the executive team showed up, but there needs to be an internal champion. And that person needed to have the sway and the ability to get, and they needed to be a catalyst, right? Get everybody excited about it. And they have been selling your services to their people already before you're there. And so this is a really, really nice, um, warm welcome ramp to walk into and the executives have had to say to themselves and each other this is going to be valuable enough that we're going to give up half a day which is far more valuable than whatever company money they could be putting into the project yeah no that that, that right. resonates for sure and it's it's definitely been an unintended consequence but i think there's a little bit of a invoking the law of reciprocity that happens uh, as well now, uh, yeah there there's there's also um, another force of influence that that you have going on here, which is really a nice example, is when you have people with personal experience, and especially people in leadership roles with personal experience, those people will be your best mavens and catalysts and smooth spreaders. So um, nonprofits often will have requirements for people to join the board, not just that you need to be donating money, but you need to be showing up and getting personal experiences with who they serve. Like I worked with the Red Cross and the Red Cross team in New York, they had their board members every single year go on a, go on, it, they went on a ride that in the middle of the night, they would be showing up at a house fire and the Red Cross will deliver blankets and 
emergency supplies and they help people get to the resources that they need. And it doesn't matter that you know intellectually that that's a really important service. And the Red Cross does lots of other stuff, but you got to be there in that moment where somebody's life was getting totally, totally changed and they're experiencing the biggest personal disaster that they've probably ever had. And so you are personally committed. And then the board members are also influencing their friends and their family and their networks to be donating money and getting involved. So I encourage everyone who's in a position to be able to do this, to try to get leaders personally involved in the projects that they want to spread through those organizations. And of course, leaders can only get personally involved in a handful of them. Yeah, no, I think that makes a ton of sense. Uh, Zoe, I'd love to unpack uh, you do uh, how you do a great job of breaking the brain into like two labels, you use the judge and the gator. And uh, we think it's our judge that's making these decisions for us, but it's actually very little of that, it's the gator. So what the heck is the gator and what does that have to do with influence? For people who are familiar with behavioral economics, will, which will be a minority of the audience, this is system one and system two in behavioral economics parlance. But I use the analogy of a gator and a judge just because it's stickier and easier to remember. And these are two systems that are determining 100% of our decisions and our behavior. And it's not anatomy and it's, it's an analogy, but it loosely maps to anatomy. The gator piece is the far more powerful piece. And this is one that is unconscious, intuitive, automatic, habitual. And I use the analogy of a gator because alligators are the laziest animals on earth. And they're so lazy because they're so efficient. And they can go, I don't know if you remember from the book, you've done an incredible amount of preparation, Jeff. You don't happen to remember how long an alligator can go without eating, do you? Okay, I have been telling that story to anybody okay. anybody who will listen. And I, 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 what I don't remember is the exact amount of days, but I'm just going to say it was like somewhere around like a year or something like that. Yeah, it's and, three years. And I could not believe yeah. it. Yeah. Because like, all you, you see in your algorithm, it's all these wildebeest getting just yesterday. I saw an antelope right. skip, skipping through a, a, a small, shallow lake, narrowly escaping an alligator attack. And I'm like, oh, Zoe, there you are. You're forever emblazoned in my brain with this alligator <laughs> analogy. So, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Most of what alligators do is nothing. They are always scanning the environment for opportunities and threats, but they are super lazy and they almost never take action. So you can think of this as the status quo is so this big, heavy beast. These gators weigh a thousand pounds. They have a brain the size of a walnut and they don't need to take action. So they typically don't take action. And this is almost everyone's response to almost all of our influence attempts, which is nothing. So that's just, first of all, lazy, ease, and friction matter a whole lot, and just expect that the response is going to be nothing. The alligators and this process is the part of our mind that is biased. It's driven by habits, automatic behaviors. When it takes action, it's very, very quick. So an alligator snapping at that little antelope very, very fast when it does move. And our unconscious reactions are so fast that we hardly perceive them. Like social judgments. When we meet someone, we're constantly asking ourselves, but it's unconscious. Do I like this person? Do I respect this person? As one example happens instantaneously. So if you think about- Zoe, and I want to I want to jump in there real quick because that, ahead, yeah. that is another piece in the book that, that totally floored me, is that you call them like with, with thin slices of exposure, we have an uncanny ability to accurately assess somebody's capabilities, if I'm interpreting that correctly. And that- Not quite. Okay, so that's what I was hoping that you'd correct me. So tell me more what that means. I think this domain of thin slice research is really, really interesting. And what it tells us sounds like what you just said, that we can judge people's capabilities really, really quickly. But actually what we can judge instantaneously is other people's reactions. So the most dramatic example I know of thin slice research is with surgeons. 
And surgeons who were sued for malpractice, surgeons who were never sued for malpractice, and then people in this experiment got to predict who they, which surgeons were sued for malpractice and which weren't. And they got to hear just a, they got to hear two 10 second clips of the surgeon's voice when they were talking to a patient. And that was the only means that they had of predicting who got sued for malpractice. The crazy thing about this, Jeff, is that the clips were garbled so that you couldn't hear the words. You could only hear the tone of voice. So you had this mini exposure to someone's tone of voice, and that's predicting who gets sued for malpractice. Because what gets conveyed in the tone of voice is respect or disrespect, empathy or lack of empathy. And it was that feeling that had patients decide whether to sue for malpractice when something went wrong. Okay, so what? here's what you're making me wonder about is like the sleazy, manipulative salesperson, used, you know, the bad example of a used car salesman. Is the used car salesman in these examples the one getting sued or not? Yes. Okay, that's, okay, that's really helpful for me. That is definitely the one getting sued. And I'm glad you brought up this used car salesman smarmy archetype of sales. And by the way, I used to work in sales as well, just a little bit, but I'm so happy to get to have that experience to realize, as you already know, when you know people who are successful in sales, they're exactly the opposite. They're the opposite of the smarmy used car salesman type that we a lot of people think of as being salesy, right? Those people don't sell a lot of stuff. They yeah. don't have a long lasting, great career usually. Yeah. And sales, the master salespeople will go back, research tells me, and maybe you can tell me differently, but will go back six or seven times after getting a no. Average salespeople three times, average human being zero times. And when people hear that, they're like, oh my God, that's horrible because they're imagining the used car salesman. But the reality is that that person is never going to sell something the sixth or seventh time that they went back because nobody's talking to them six or seven times. You try to never see them again after your first encounter. But what master salespeople are doing really well is building rapport and understanding as you are, like, what's a warm lead? What are, like, is this someone that I even should come back to and talk to again? Were they interested, but this just isn't the right time, right? And ask permission. Shall I check back with you? And so they're welcomed. And then they're building a relationship so that eventually when it is the right time, that person is there. Yeah. So I know we got off a little bit, but the thin slice research is predicting other people's reactions. And what that means is we just have very sticky emotional reactions. Our first impressions are incredibly powerful. Other thin slice research finds surprisingly that we can predict winners of elections by a one second exposure to their face, which is kind of depressing because this is a lot of bias, but it's about their competence. Even kids can do it. We can predict teaching evaluations. We can predict sales success similarly to surgeons. And But Zoe, how does it correlate to impact? Because so if, if we can predict who's going to get elected, I mean, we elect a lot of <laughs> crooked characters. And I, and, I, and I just keep thinking about all the evidence of the, uh, the egotistical, largely white males that get promoted into even bigger positions of power and influence. So like, what's the relationship between th that's who's going to win, they win, but was that the right, was that the right candidate? So should somebody else that didn't show up positively on a thin slice have won and made a bigger impact instead? We have all of our biases coming in here strong in thin slice research. And some of these biases are based on things like racism and sexism and every other social thing that makes it hard to be a diverse and inclusive society. And then some of our biases are emotional about how somebody treats us, say, about empathy. So there's there's nothing that's right or wrong empirically about these gator judgments. They're just very powerful. Right. And so I already talked about my own sexism with my daughter. We, we live in societies where it's almost impossible not to have sexist, racist, and all kinds of ist biases in that in, it doesn't matter what race or gender we are. 
our culture has it, so we're there. And we just try to put guardrails around our actual behavior and we use policies to do that and bring it up in groups with other people who care about it. We try to do better, but about the politicians that we're electing, Jeff, oh my God. I I I'm just really scared about um the rise of autocracy in so many countries in the world right now. We're electing a lot of leaders that that are seen as strong and powerful and their strength is getting prioritized over, over a lot of other things. And then um, they use that strength in ways that are scary as heck. So it, it sounds like episode two of Unleashed with, with uh, Zoe Chance is going to be about the culture at Barbie. Episode three is going to be on the state of politics. So we'll, we'll, we'll shelve and, those for a sec. But here, here's what I'm thinking. And I know this is a big topic in the time that we have. And, and um, if our listeners are anything in, like I am, I'm wondering now, knowing that these thin slices provide so much powerful information to people in a, in a world of a lot of different tactics, what are maybe just two or three simple tactics that people want to start paying attention to so that they're putting themselves in the best light for their thin slices to be positively received? Sure. I'll give three super specific, very easy to act on ones. And you probably do all of these things, and most of us can be doing them more consciously. The first one is just smiling. Smiling is a way that we show people that we like them. It is a, it's a submission move evolutionarily. Smiling happens more often in more diverse cultures and more diverse cities than in less diverse cities. But when I show people how to smile in a charismatic way, there's a difference between just going around smiling and then smiling because of someone. So like if I'm already smiling and I and you see me, you're like, oh, it's always a happy person. But yeah. if I unsmile and then I see you and you see that you brought the smile to my face, this is influential and you get to feel that I like you. Gotcha. So number one is the responsive smile and um, that lets the other person feel special. Number two is using people's names. and neuroscience has supported what Dale Carnegie wrote about ages ago and how to win friends and influence people that he said something like a person's name is the most beautiful sound in their language. And what neuroscience research has shown is that our name activates a unique neurological pattern of this self-referential network and no other word does this besides our name. This is why we can wake up from sleep or we can hear someone across a crowded room that's loud talking about us. When you say somebody's name, it gives them this <gasps> feeling of their gator is like, oh, Jeff is talking about me. And this is a positive gator response, like the smile. And then the third thing, which takes longer than a nanosecond, is in the conversation, the one of the most important things that has us like other people is did they ask us follow-up questions? So you, this is what you you do just constantly in your interviews on this podcast. And so you're trained in it. You practice it well. And most people probably don't even notice it. Like you already in this conversation, let the conversation go to places that although you had a ton of preparation, you weren't planning for us to go there right? And yeah. so for me, experiencing this conversation with you, I feel like, oh, Jeff is listening to me. He's actually listened to what I said. He cared about my response and he's allowing me to influence him. So yeah. through being responsively happy and smiling, using people's names, asking follow-up questions, we're showing other people that we care and we see them as an individual and we're open to their influence. So I love those tactics and anybody can start doing them more right away. And you're right. I think as people hear those three, they're probably checking off that, oh, I kind of do that. I kind of do that. But there's ways that we could probably tighten it up. We can do it even more. Well, and I'm, I'm laughing at the name, using people's names and how people will, will, will hear that in a, in a noisy room. So I will sometimes actually play with the decibel level of my voice. So if I recognize that someone's in the same restaurant and they haven't noticed me yet, I will intentionally lower my voice and start to say their name in sentences with whoever I'm with. And they'll know they're, they'll know they'll be in on it, trying to wait how long it and see how long it takes for that person to notice. And that's I, so cool. I'm constantly stunned by how effective that is. Like it's it's unreal. 
It really is unreal. So it's good, really um, cool. Good tips. And, and thank you. You shared a very nice sort of sentiment about uh, this conversation so far. But I would say that you're just as you're equally as responsible, if not more. I think when you have these kinds of conversations, there's uh, there's an intricate dance that sometimes gets in sync or not. But you're just you're very gracious and very thoughtful in your responses. So you make it very easy to get into a, an off the script kind of a uh, of a dialogue. Well, I can't wait to get off the script when we actually meet up in a few months. Yeah, so, me too. You. Me too. Yeah, which is a great segue to say that uh, Zoe Chance is going to be at the uh, the Business Execution Summit in March 2024. So uh, there's only a few tickets left, actually. So hope to uh, to see people there. Now, uh, Zoe, here's a question that you're going to love. And in fact, you might want to take out a pen and, and write it down. Uh, but you call uh, you talk about a tactic uh, called framing, and it's almost like creating anticipation. And I wonder how uh, it's used for influence. See what just happened? <laughs> you did. Yes. Yes. You totally built it up. The pre-framing. Um, framing is how we can influence people's expectations and their experiences and their evaluations. And um, I'm thinking about how fun it would be to go and grab a glass of wine with you, Jeff. So I have a wine study on my mind and then I'll share this experiment to me illustrates the profundity of the power of a frame. And this is, it can be a perspective or it can be the label. It's how do we think about this thing? What do we think we're going to get? And then what do we feel we're getting? And what do we feel we got? This wine study was done by a neuroscientist named Hilke Plasman, and she brings wine drinkers into the lab to drink wine. But because she's a neuroscientist, it's the worst possible way that you could ever feed anybody wine because she immobilizes them in an fMRI machine. And you have this little tiny tube going into your mouth, and it's just feeding you little sips of wine. This study is a study of price as a frame. So before each sip of wine, she's telling you on the screen, it says, this is how much that bottle of wine was. And then you have a sip and then she scans the gustatory pleasure centers of your brain to see how much pleasure did you get from the wine. Unsurprisingly, the more expensive bottles of wine create more sparks in your brain in the medial orbital frontal cortex and other regions she's looking at. That that's how wine should work, right? Like more expensive wine should be better. But this was a scientific experiment of price as a frame. And so she was manipulating, changing only the price. Everything else was kept constant. And that meant the wine itself was just randomized. It didn't matter if it was an actual expensive or cheap bottle of wine. What mattered was the frame, the expectations. Did you think this was going to be a great bottle of wine? Or did you think it was going to be we call in the States two buck Chuck. I don't know if you have this at Trader Joe's. <laughs> well, yeah, we don't have Trader Joe's up here, but yeah, we're unfamiliar, okay. uh, familiar with the concept for sure. No, is, do we, yeah. do we create our own frames then? So I use the wine analogy. The wine always tastes better when I'm at the winery and, uh, oh, yeah, for so sure. we just sort of sometimes are creating these own frames for ourselves or is it the same thing? People will pay more for an object if they know the story. Like if it was uh, a World War I artifact that was in the trenches uh, in Normandy, they'll pay more if it was as opposed to it just being a letter opener from, you know, wherever, from Boston that never left Boston. Is that the same thing? Um, I wouldn't say a story is exactly the same as a frame, but it's also just a very powerful way yeah. to create meaning for okay. the object. The, a frame is just a little simpler. It's just a yeah. perspective. And the, the perspective would be like, this is going to be great. Or it's an actual name, label, title. Like we could think of um, framing in uh, contexts like climate change, right? Yeah. First, we had global warming. That was a frame, the littler label. And then we have climate change, which had people feel this was more accurate and less of a problem. And then more recently, shifting the frame to climate crisis or climate emergency. Yeah. And the, the name influences the perspective that we bring to it. But we do always have the perspective that we're bringing to something. And there's a possibility of changing frames and influencing people's frames. But it's hard, especially if they're, um, if they're long-time frames and they feel really sticky. So if you want to shift somebody's frame, ideally jump in as soon as you can. 
right at the beginning of say there's a new project, new initiative, the name of it really, really matters. Say there's a crisis, the name of it matters. What do you call it right now? Yeah, that well, that makes um, that makes perfect sense. And uh, some people will be listening to this. Others will watch it on YouTube. But I want to reference the way that what happened when I for those that are listening, go and check out the YouTube video, because when I when I asked Zoe the question, I used a frame and I I had no idea what, if, if, if I was doing it correctly or if it would even work. But she actually reached out of the frame to grab a pen and come back. And so I couldn't have predicted it was going to work that way, but it was a perfect uh, sort of segue, Zoe. So thanks. We, and we didn't rehearse it, right? That's right. <laughs> we didn't rehearse it. Well, and, and it also made me think, um, James Clear, I think, is if I'm reading it correctly, because there's a whole bunch of different frames that you talk about in the book. And, and so that's why people got to go buy the book. But um, Atomic Habits is one of the best-selling books, you know, five years running, I think. And I, I've heard him talk on other podcasts about one of the reasons he thinks it's been a great selling book, but he's never talked about it, I don't, I don't think, deliberately in terms of frames. But I think he used the monumental and the simple frame. Would that be a yeah. fair assessment? Okay. Mon monumental and, um, well, actually, atomic, maybe... Maybe they're both manageable because atomic literally means really, really small, but it sounds really big because of we the yeah, atomic I bomb. I don't think we have a small reference point. When, like, I think we think about, you know, it, a lot of bad thoughts, but it's, it's I like agree. massively by the, by blowing the way, up your world. <laughs> James Clear and I worked with the same editor. Oh, come on. So, no way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. And I, and I think that our editor is the one who came up the, for, with the name for James okay. Clear's book. He was putting so much pressure on himself for mine. Influence is your superpower. I like it, but it's kind of like a long yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's monumental, but Atomic Habits is just like short yeah. and sweet. I love it. And, uh, and I, I want to encourage folks, like even if, even if you're setting up meetings with your team, I think you can use framing to get people more excited about mundane team meetings. Like, have you seen it used that way, Zoe? Um, absolutely. I mean, we should be framing our work and our projects far more often than we do. And even with more mundane things than team meetings, we can all come up with a reason. Well, first of all, I don't know. I like to come up with names for my teams that I'm on and, you know, maybe like my TA team that I have for my class is team narwhal. And one of the TA is just just that she liked narwhals, but now we're team narwhal. And when we do events together, like we do fundraising every year, we show up, we do cold calling and we all wear narwhal onesies <laughs> and the TAs and I, and we got the development office to buy some narwhal onesies as well. So we have this little team name frame that makes our group feel more cohesive as a group. Um, but just having, having a purpose for this is what we're gonna get to done today, even at the most boring level, I had a student who decided that he was going to have a frame and a goal outcome every time he watched television. <laughs> and this is a student who was in the theater program at Yale, and he was trying to learn with each television program that he watched. So his frame would be, I'm going to watch this show and I'm going to learn about editing. I'm going to watch this show. I'm going to learn about costumes. I'm going to watch this show and I'm going to learn about dialogue. And just bringing an intentional frame to the work that we do, to the projects we're involved in, um, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yeah, and there is so much there. And it reminds me a little bit of like the brain finds what we tell it to find. Like if, if someone said, find everything that's read on Zoe's bookshelf, I mean, I'm looking at the third shelf from the top on your all the books, all that kind of stuff. But the other thing that I really liked is um, you're increasing the probability that people are going to enjoy the experiences you create with them if you do framing properly. So if you tell people at the beginning of a conference that there's going to be one nugget of information that is going to completely change the way you view leadership, so make sure you're paying attention, they're, they're going to not only be attuned for it more, but once they find at least one nugget, they're going to have a much more positive feeling of the event that you, cre that you created and curated. And I think that that is a very, very powerful, simple thing that anybody can do. So that's, again, I, this is one of 
my favorite books I have ever read. And um, I read a lot of great books, but there's just, and I'll elaborate more on that at the end, but there's just so many um, simple tips. Um, so Thank it's you. great, Zoe. Uh, I so appreciate it. And what you did also, by the way, is an example of setting high hopes and low expectations. And that's such a ninja leadership move because yeah. high hopes motivates people and low expectations makes it hard to fail. And this is just such a recipe for people really investing a lot and feeling great about it. Yeah, and this, so looking at the book and, and this conversation's reinforced it. Like I think I've always really tried to simplify things. And when I think about leadership, or not leadership, influence. So if somebody came to me and wanted a lay person's take on it, like I think, I think some of the advice I would give people is to be genuinely excited about the thing that you're doing and talking about. Like enthusiasm is infectious. And I think that comes back to the smile thing. I think I would say be, be authentically curious about everybody that you talk to. Be, you know, be, um, be, um, uh, per, I would say be persistent, which is kind of, you referred to that in the book, just friendly and, and persistent. I think those are some of the things that I would say. And then the fourth thing would be always have a, uh, your best guess as to what is in it for the person that you're speaking with. Because so often we come at it from our own perspective, but um, you know, kind of oversimplifying. But I think there are some things in the book, the research things and the tips that you talk about that reinforce at least pieces of that. Yeah, thank you. And um, I would, I would add a couple more things. One is that with that, the insta judgments of do I like this person? Do I respect this person? Liking is vastly more powerful than respect. So a lot of times we're trying to, too hard to prove how knowledgeable and capable and expert we are because we're a little insecure. And we also, we want to bring all the facts and data and information, but actually if they don't like us, it doesn't matter how competent we are. So first, they really, really have to like us. Yes. And then the second piece I would bring is that other people, when we're trying to influence them, it's so important that they feel that they have agency. And what that means is we need to really give them agency. Yeah. They have agency. And yeah. we need to let them know that it's, it's up to them. We're not going to try to coerce them. And this is how it should always be, right? Like in the domain of sales, we want to sell somebody something that they want right yeah. and we want them to be happy that they got it this product or service and we don't want them to regret it and have, feel buyer's remorse and then come back and try to get out of it negate the contract or just not follow through with the payment whatever this is so we really when we're influencing people to get into contractual agreements with us or even just tiny agreements we really want them to want to say yes we don't just want to get them to say yes. So I would say this book is focused on becoming someone that other people want to say yes to and that process of self-development. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Now, I can't let you off the hook in this conversation without sharing the magical question of influence. So Zoe, I wonder if you could share the magical question and, and then what makes it such a powerful uh, question? I would love to. Can I share a story? Yes, please. Okay. I share this story in the book and i love it because it illustrates the power of the magic question and what's not totally obvious about it the magic question is just what would it take and if you work in sales or business development you probably ask a question like this sometimes make sure you're not asking what can i do or is there anything that i can do um it's what would it take this story was told by Gloria Steinem, who's an American feminist, when she came to my hometown a few years ago. And she was talking about when she was working on the problem of sex trafficking. She was in Zambia. She'd gone to a conference where she was one of the featured speakers. And then after the conference, she travels to this village in a rural area near a game preserve where three young women had been lost to sex trafficking in the previous year, and they were never heard from again. She asks the women of this village when they are seated together in a circle on a tarp in the middle of a barren field, the magic question. She asks, what would it take to make sure that no one from this village will be sex trafficked again? They told her an electric fence. An electric fence, she asks. 
They said what happens when the corn reaches a certain height is the elephants come and they eat it, they trample it. We have nothing to feed our families. We have nothing to sell in the market. We have no money to send our kids to school. And the families of these young women were desperate. So Gloria Steinem says, okay, listen, if I raise the money, will you build the fence and clear the field, plant the corn? They say, yes, absolutely. She says, great. I will do it. She does. And they do. She comes back a few years later and she says, there's a massive crop of corn and no one has been sex trafficked from the village since they got the fence. The magic question, what would it take, works on so many different levels. And I call it the magic question because it is so simple. It's so commonly useful. You can use it in almost any conversation with almost anyone. And you can use it again and again with the same people, even if you've taught them the magic question. Like my daughter, who I mentioned, or my students will use the magic question. And then the person you're at will be like, oh, the magic question again. But it still works because first, it's respectful. Secondly, it shifts the frame from I'm trying to get you to do something to let's approach this problem creatively and see if we can problem solve together. Thirdly, you often get answers that you just couldn't have anticipated. So I might have been trying to tell you, here's what you need to do, or Gloria Steinem might have been offering advice for, here's how to solve the problem of sex trafficking because she was an expert. But instead, she asks the magic question and she finds that this is for this village. It's not just a sex trafficking problem and not just a poverty problem. It's a human wildlife conflict problem. And she couldn't have known what were the obstacles in the way for these people in this village without asking. The least obvious part of the magic question is that what happens when somebody answers the question, usually there's an answer. Not always, but more often than you think. They're laying out a roadmap, like they're basically laying breadcrumbs down the trail. And when those breadcrumbs have been followed, whether you did something, they did something, forces in the universe shifted so that those things have happened that they said it would take. When that means that there's a fence in this village, then the person who told you that what it would take is a fence will be making sure that no one gets sex trafficked. So I don't hear that story as it was the fence that protected women from sex trafficking. I read that story as it's the women who asked for the fence, who protected their neighbors and sisters and kids from sex trafficking. And there's some support for that theory. The women of that village, after that first meeting, they continued to meet with each other and they ended up starting a chicken farm and a tailoring operation. And at least for the next few years, that women's group continued. They called their group Waka Simba, which means strong women. Mm. So magic question, what would it take? And not, is there anything I can do? Or what would I need to do? Because there might be nothing that you can do. But there's something that someone else could do. And sometimes they'll take total responsibility. So employees, kids, family, friends, partners, bosses, just what would it take? You don't have to have the answer, just have to have the question. And this is the start of a conversation. Yeah, it opens itself up to surprisingly simple answers. Like how often do we solve the problem in our minds uh, and make the wrong choice? Like I would be tempted to say, well, what do we need to do to reform the criminal code? Or what do we need to do to uh, raise funds for more policing or, 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 or whatever it might be? And it wasn't that. So it's uh, it's a brilliant question. I've already started using it. Too early to tell you the outcomes, but I'm, I'm trying to be intentional about uh, about how I use it. Jeff, I challenge you to use it today. Okay, okay. And I challenge everyone listening or watching, use the magic question today. You will absolutely find an opportunity if you look for it. And it can be something really tiny. Like it could be, you know, me asking my daughter, what would it take for you to have your room clean two days from now, and she's going to tell me something. I did that recently with what would it take for you to actually start putting the dishes in the dishwasher? Because it's a struggle that we have. And it turns out what it would take is we have a dance party, we play music in the kitchen, and we make it fun. And now she is actually loading the dishwasher. So it, it's lots of times less than you think. That it would take. So I got it. I already know uh, how I'm going to use it, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to spare you the details right now. But I'll, I'll share it with you off camera once our conversation's done today. 
Okay, I will be curious. I, I've got to I've got to switch gears on you a little bit, and I, I uh, couldn't help but wonder what your thoughts are on the growing rise of uh, influencer culture and just influencers on social mm. media. I'm just fascinated to hear what your perspective and, and what your sort of beliefs are around uh, that trend. I'm curious what yours are as well. Um, one of my thoughts is that kind of like how the really annoying salespeople have given sales a bad rap, the used car salesman types. Now, this is how a lot of people think of sales. Using this frame of influencer typically is describing super annoying and greedy materialistic people on social media who are just kind of whoring themselves out for free products or money that they will pretend that they actually use this stuff and they're just trying to sell things to their followers. Those people are really annoying, right? But real social media influencers and real real life influencers are just influential people. So we have people who are political activists and artists and just normal people who are delivering great messages and help people like you're an influencer, right? You're an influencer for good leadership and helping people run their businesses better and helping their employees be more engaged and more happy. But people wouldn't think of you with the label of influencer the same way that they might think of some, you know, bodybuilder who's selling nutritional products as an influencer. So I find them annoying, the people who get labeled as that. But the reality is that we're just using influencer to describe influence on social media. Yeah, yeah. And my, my quick take on it is I, I think early on I was optimistic that it, it might enable uh, folks to uh, earn a really decent living that they might not normally be able to. So kind of take control over their own destiny in, in ways in it. So it might help folks that are of minorities and, and uh, underrepresented groups. It looks so far like the data is not supporting that, though. It's like Kim Kardashian gets richer, but Kim, your neighbor, doesn't. So uh, so that's tricky to watch. And yeah, and I think it's only making the sort of the misinformation uh, age uh, worse as well. So there's a lot of uh, effort that's having to go on to fight uh, the the, um, the the wrong kind of influencing behavior on uh, on social media. Yeah, I want to ask you follow up question to this. And you mentioned enthusiasm earlier. This is a topic that I struggle with that I don't have an answer to at all. But as you were saying earlier, enthusiasm is so persuasive. It's so influential. I'm much, I'm very moved if you tell me about something that you're excited about because I feel it and it's contagious. Um, I learned recently that pharmaceutical companies will hire cheerleaders. They will hire college cheerleaders to sell drugs because of their enthusiasm. Um, but what is hard is when you have somebody who is an enthusiastic person and they're choosing to or they're having to try to sell a product or service or an idea that they're not passionate about. Um, I know I've been in that situation before of bringing my natural enthusiastic behavior to um, trying to sell something that I didn't really feel so excited about. Ha what can we even think or do or what do we do with this fake enthusiasm? Yeah. So I think it, I think it depends a little on like so many things on the context. If, if somebody is in a job and they need that job for survival, I think it maybe is a different conversation or different context. If it's not, because the first, my first advice would be get the heck out of that environment. Stop selling that thing. Now, if it's an unethical product, I, uh, I, I'm careful in how I say this, but I don't think there's really many excuses at all to sell something that you know is a manipulative type of environment. But one of the tricky pieces of this too is we know we come back to the brain, we value belonging more than we value ethics, right? Like we've, we value being part of a community more than we value like honesty and truth. And so if our community or our livelihood is at jeopardy, we will do all kinds of things that we wouldn't normally do. Um, so there's that. But if, if it's something that's not an, an ethical discussion, I think people have to find something genuine that they could get excited about. Like maybe just get excited about incremental progress. Like just maybe get excited that that um, you, you, you can make 10 new connections every single day. And you could get excited that I'm, it's not about the product, but I know that every relationship I build 
is going to lead to something different down the road. And I cannot predict what conversation I'm going to have today that's going to do it. But it's almost like a form of framing, I think, Zoe, that if you convince yourself that every relationship has benefit, even if you're not excited about the product, as long as you think the product has a reasonable chance to help somebody, you could get excited that you're making a new relationship regardless of the product. So that's some of my initial thoughts. It kind of sounds like rationalizing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we're <laughs> and, so good at that, right? <laughs> and we're so good at it. And and I think when we are acting enthusiastic, are, we're also influencing ourselves, right? And telling ourselves like, oh, this is, um, well, at least... I can enjoy the relationship that I'm building or so, but if I, if I don't believe in this thing that I'm trying to persuade you of, but like you said, it really matters what that thing is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It matters a lot. Yeah. yeah. Zoe, do you have, I know our time is run, is, is, is growing short here. Do you have time for one more, uh, what I would call a, a more personal question? Sure thing. So in your book, you were very open right at the very, very, very beginning about the conditions that you grew up in as a child. And so you came from, as you call it and describe it, a bohemian, uh, bohemian for poor family. You shared a bedroom with your sister while your mother slept on the couch. Uh, so that paints a little bit of a picture and that, you know, you loved your home life, but school life was very lonely for you. And this does not sound like the background of somebody that would rise to notoriety as an influence expert. And one of the things that you did is you enrolled in theater and then you started taking on sales roles, as you alluded to earlier. And I just I'm fascinated to hear what what is it about you that caused you to whatever, if it was courage or motivation to face your fears head on. Whoa. Um. It's weird. My husband was just telling me this week that he's never known anyone who so frequently steps out of their comfort zone and looks for opportunities to step out of their comfort zone. Um, like I've recently been doing, joining improv classes that are really hard and really scary, and I haven't done anything like that for a while. Started doing ecstatic dance. Um, I wore an axolotl costume on a flight for no reason, just to have a little bit of fun a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I, I don't know where that feeling comes from that it, it, I've trained my brain to say doing things that are scary is a sign that you are being brave and you're on the right path. And it's probably from, from my folks. Uh, my mom or my dad, I don't know, but I really do believe that the only way that we can expand our comfort zone is by stepping outside of it again and again and again. And we typically find out that it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I do wonder sometimes, like, and I've read some books on this and I, I don't, I don't, I don't have a good grasp of the data on this to make a, an inf a, a confidently informed opinion, but there, there is some data, like, um, there's a book called the gold mine effect where it studied all these regions of the world where they produced an abnormally high amount of world-class athletes. Like Jamaica was sprinters and Japan was female golfers. And, and I think Russia was the female tennis program. There's a little bit of like, when you, when you come from like nothing to lose. It's like, hey, I don't, I don't really have a lot. I have, mm -hmm. I have love and I, and I have people that I care about, but I don't have a lot of things to lose possession wise. And so why wouldn't I like just kind of go for it? Um, but it, I don't know. It just sounds like you've grown up in a very compassionate environment. Like you're writing. It, it's, it's, um, it's not just informative. And I've said this only a few times to folks that I've had a chance to meet th through this uh, uh, podcast, but there's a, there's a kindness and a compassion with which you write. And that really comes through. And I don't know if, if anybody's told you that before, but spending time with you to, here today, like, uh, like we have, that comes through in spades in terms of your personality. So Zoe, I just, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with me here today. And I can't I wait for this episode to hit the airwaves. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the wonderful compliment. And also it's funny the book originally when I wrote the proposal was called Influence for Nice People. And it was my agent who had chosen this title and she's Canadian. And so jokingly, we called it Influence for Canadians <laughs> as it was first created. So it really is still Influence for Canadians. 
Okay. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I wish that was the title. It, it would have sold a, a bunch of copies here and it probably wouldn't have sold anywhere else. So good thing that you didn't label it that, but I wish there could be a special edition, a re-release uh, just north of the border. Um, so anyway, Zoe, thank you thank again you. for joining us. And where can people track you down? So if people want to learn more about your work and get in touch with you, where can they do that? So my book is easy to find influences your superpower wherever you get books and you can find me like honestly like I have a website zoechance.com but I'm also just really easy to find on LinkedIn so you're welcome to connect with me Zoe Chance and Jeff thank you so much you're just absolutely delightful to talk with. Well thank, thank you. you thank you very much and thanks everybody for tuning in and I can't wait to hear stories of how you're using tidbits from this conversation today with Zoe to enhance your own influence superpower until next time be well everybody. If you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful, don't forget to give us a five-star rating and subscribe to our YouTube channel or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. And if you're part of a leadership team and you just know that your organization is capable of even better performance, please reach out to us at UnleashResults.com for a conversation and to learn more about how we might help unleash the potential of your team and organization.